Uh, now onto the main event. I am honored to introduce Linda Pastan to all of you. She has published 15 volumes of poetry, uh, most recently Insomnia, which won the Towson University Literary Award and A Dog Runs Through It. Two of her books have been finalists for the National Book Award, one for the Los uh, Angeles Times Book Prize. She taught for several years at American University and was on the staff of the Breadloaf's Writers Conference for 20 years. She is a past poet laureate of Maryland and has won numerous awards, including the Radcliffe Distinguished Alumni Award and the Maurice English Award. In 2003, she won the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize for Lifetime Achievement. Uh, this afternoon, she will be talking about her new collection, Almost an Elegy, New and Later Selected Poems. This new collection is composed of selected poems from five of her most recent collections, plus over 30 new previously unpublished poems. They present a profound survey of mortality, loss, and the quiet beauty of everyday life. Publishers Weekly in a starred review of Almost an Elegy writes that this luminous volume shows a master craftsperson reveling and reflecting on the world's beauties and pains, finding deep meaning at every turn. And they called Linda uh, Pastan a poet of unusual generosity, humanity, and skill. So everyone, let us welcome Linda Pastan. Thank you for the introduction and thank all of you for coming on such a beautiful day. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, this is the first in poetry, in person poetry reading I've given in over four years. I'm not sure I remember how to do it. Um, but I've, I've given publication readings for most of my books at Politics and Foes, and I couldn't not do it this time. So I'm going to start by reading a group from the new poems um, part and then read a couple of poems from each of the other books, and then come back and end with one or two new poems. This is Sting. A bee stung the palm of your right hand, or did you touch a nettle? There was a swelling, the burn of pain, a poison flower blooming in the flesh, and neither ice nor baking soda helped. You carried it around, right hand and left, as if it belonged to somebody else. And you were angry, not at the possible bee whose buzz was all you knew of it, not at the nettle, hidden scourge of the summer garden. It was the wound itself that angered you, an early soldier in the army of afflictions waiting for us, even in the innocent grass. Um, the next one I'm going to read is, is about downsizing, which I know a lot of people uh, have either just done or thinking of doing. And um, this poem takes place before I actually did downsize when, when a young friend um, talked about how difficult it was closing her mother's house, and I didn't want my children to have to do that. So that gave me pause for thought. This is plunder to a, new, to a young friend. On a day of windy transition, one season to the next, you spoke of helping your mother close her house, of the choices you had to make, what to discard, what to keep, as if it were your childhood itself waiting to be plundered. You kept a Persian rug all reds and golds, to walk on every day, keeping the past alive under your feet. Those nested Russian dolls you played with as a girl, grandmother, mother, daughter, four bent with chairs wrenched from their table. I listened, thinking I'd be next to try to crowd a lifetime of things into a shrinking universe of boxes. I've started dismantling my life already, throwing out letters from people I remember loving, choosing among books, this one to stay, that one to go, as if I were a judge sentencing some to death, the rest to the purgatory of the emptying shelf. 
Perhaps I should simply burn it all. But don't we live on in what we've left behind, in the fading twilight of Kodak, in our sterling knives and spoons tarnishing on a grandchild's casual table? Don't these become a kind of museum of the afterlife? The pharaohs had it right. They took their whole world with them, vases and chests, gilded statues, jewels, plundered, perhaps, but not for a thousand years. Nefertiti's tomb has never been found. A very small poem. Small poems are generally my favorite, and I have a very hard time going beyond one page, so I try. This is called Instruction. You must rock your pain in your arms until it's asleep, then leave it in a darkened room and tiptoe out. For a moment, you will feel the emptiness of peace, but in the next room, your pain is already stirring. Soon, it will be calling your name. Back in the day, we used to spend almost a, a week every year in Naples, Italy, not, not Florida. And um, there, there were road signs to, to Florence, to Rome, and the strangest sign um, was to the entrance of the underworld. Um, that really was a sign, and we first went there, I think my daughter was 15, and wrote a play about the entrance to the underworld, but it took me all this, all this time to finally write a poem about it. <clears throat> it's called The Tourist. We saw the entrance to the underworld outside of Naples, just after eating pizza at that special place, and before boarding the ferry to Capri. We could tick it off our list of sights to see, but there was nothing to see. Ground bleached of features, colorless air. And remembering Odysseus and his journey here, meeting the ghost of his long dead mother, we felt cheated as if someone from our growing list of lost friends should have emerged to greet us. Well, I'm going to read a poem that I have sort of mixed feelings about. It's Ode to My Car Key, and this is when I, I had a car key. I mean, you know what they used to look like now? You just walk by your car and it opens and starts. But this is the old-fashioned kind, Ode to My Car Key. Silver bullet, shape of a treble clef, I slip you in the ignition, an arrow seeking its target, where you fit like a thread in the eye of a needle, like a man and a woman. A click and the engine roars, the road unscrolls on its way to anywhere. At night, you sleep in the darkness of a drawer on a pillow of tarnished coins. O oh, faithful key, last week I gave you up for good, Excalibur back in its stone as I climbed into the waiting vehicle of old age. Um, a question that, that I'm often asked in the question periods is what poets I like and I'm reading. And one of them um, is Jane Kenyon, whose probably best known poem um, is Let Evening Come, and the poem that I wrote, Autumn, for Jane Kenyon, is kind of honoring that. Autumn. Let autumn come with its acorns and leaf smoke, its bronze bells tolling. Let the school doors open and the children, like small penitents, march into their classrooms. Let the subway grates become bed frames, preparing themselves for the homeless. Let autumn come. And the trees will succumb to rust, to brown. The trees will go naked. 
and the grass will fade, green will be almost forgotten. Shake out your coats from the blizzard of mothballs. Sharpen your pencils, their shavings the color of leaf falls. Let autumn come. And I'm going to read from the books in chronological order from The Last Uncle, which came out in 2002. Um, the first poem in, that I'm going to read from this book, Women on the Shore, is about an Edvard Munch woodcut, and that is the woodcut on the cover of this book. Um, I, I was going crazy trying to find a title for the book, and then I was browsing, and I said, my God, here it is. So, Women on the Shore. The pills I take to postpone death are killing me, and the healing journey we pack for waits with its broken airplane, the malarial hum of mosquitoes. Even the newly mowed domestic grass hides fault lines in the earth which could open at any time and swallow us. In Edvard Munch's woodcut, the pure geometry of color, an arctic sky, the luminescent blues and greens of water, surrounds the woman in black whose head is turning to a skull. If death is everywhere we look, at least let's marry it to beauty. And I'm going to read a poem <clears throat> that I wrote for Franny Smythe, who some of you might remember, um, called The Cossacks for Franny. For Jews, the Cossacks are always coming. Therefore, I think the sunspot on my arm is melanoma. Therefore, I celebrate New Year's Eve by counting my annual dead. My mother, when she was dying, spoke to her visitors of books and travel, displaying serenity as a form of manners, though I could tell the difference. But when I watched you planning for a life you knew you'd never have, I couldn't explain your genuine smile in the face of disaster. Was it denial laced with acceptance? Or was it generations of being English, Bronte's Lucy and Villette, living as if no fire raged beneath her dun-colored dress? I want to live the way you did, preparing for next year's famine with wine and music as if it were a ten-course banquet. But listen, those are hoofbeats on the frosty autumn air. And the next book I, I take selection from is Queen of a Rainy Country came out in 2006. Um, I was in a bus in Paris many years ago, and they had um, poetry the way some, some buses and places in this country do too, up on their wall. And they had um, a poem by Baudelaire. I couldn't read all of it, but it was um, I'll say it in French for the apologies. Je suis comme le roi d'un pays pluvieux. I am like the king of a rainy country. The headlines and feature stories alike leak blood all over the breakfast table, the wounding of the world mingling with smells of bacon and bread. Small pains are merely anterooms for larger and every shadow has a brother just waiting. Even grace is sullied by ancient angers. I must remember it has always been like this, those Trojan women learning their faiths, the sharpness of the guillotine, a filigree of cruelty adorns every culture. I've thumbed through the pages of my life longing for childhood whose failures were merely personal, 
for all the stations of love I pass through, shadows and the shadow of shadows. I am like the queen of a rainy country, powerless and grown old. Another morning with its quaint obligations, newspaper, bacon grease, rattle of dishes and bones. And uh, quite a large number of my poems are based on questions that I've been asked in the Q&A by an audience. And this one I got asked often. If I can open my book. Why are your poems so dark? Isn't the moon dark too most of the time? And doesn't the white page seem unfinished without the dark stain of alphabets? When God demanded light, he didn't banish darkness. Instead, he invented ebony and crows and that small mole on your left cheekbone. Or did you mean to ask, why are you sad so often? Ask the moon. Ask what it has witnessed. And the next book is Traveling Light, 2011. I'm going to start with another Q&A question. Um, those of you who write or are taking classes know that it um, it doesn't matter if what happened really happened, um, but I'm starting this by telling you that this really happened. Q and A. I thought I couldn't be surprised. Do you write on a computer, someone asks, and who are your favorite poets, and how much do you revise? But when the very young woman in the fourth row lifted her hand and without irony inquired, did you write your Emily Dickens poem because you like her work, or did you know her personally? <laughs> <clears throat> I entered another territory. Do I really look that old, I wanted to reply, or don't they teach you anything, or what did you just say? <laughs> the laughter that engulfed the room was partly nervous, partly simple hilarity. I won't forget that little school tucked in a lovely pocket of the South, or that girl whose face was slowly reddening. Surprise, like love, can catch our better selves unawares. I visited her house, I said. I may have met her in my dreams. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that all poems are in some sense um, political, but I don't generally write with specific political things in, in my head to, to be um, talking about, but this was specifically um, a poem about climate change that I wanted to be as a sort of warning. And um, it's, it's a pantoum, which means that it's a form based on the repetition of lines in a certain order, but you'll, you'll hear each line twice not, not next to each other, particularly. Years after the garden. Years after the garden closed on Adam, a thousand, thousand gardens take its place. Hold my hand, I hear the waters rising. Roses, lemons, lilac, hemlock, grape. A thousand, thousand gardens take its place. Is each an Eden waiting to be lost? Roses, lemons, lilac, hemlock, grape. What was God thinking when he made the apple? Is each an Eden waiting to be lost? Seeds of knowledge, carelessness, and greed. What was God thinking when he made the apple? Did he do it only for the story? Seeds of knowledge, 
carelessness and greed. They say the ice cap is already melting. Did he do it only for the story? Meringues of childhood melted on the tongue. They say the ice cap is already melting. The angel still waits with his flaming sword. Meringues of childhood melted on the tongue, but innocence alone will never save us. The angel still waits with his flaming sword. Flowers and vegetables, forests tremble. Innocence alone will never save us. How beautiful the world is in the morning. Flowers and vegetables, forests tremble. How beautiful the world is in the morning. Years ago, the garden closed on Adam. Hold my hand, I hear the waters rising. Okay. The next to last book is Insomnia, 2015. Um, in the Orchard. Why are these old gnarled trees so beautiful while well, I am merely old and gnarled? If I had leaves, perhaps, or apples, if I had bark instead of this lined skin, maybe the wind would wind itself around my limbs in its old sinuous dance. I shall bite into an apple and swallow the seeds. I shall come back as a tree. And how are we doing? The Gardener, this is <clears throat> a winter poem. He's out rescuing his fallen hollies after the renegade snowstorm, sawing their wounded limbs off quite mercilessly. I think of the scene in King's Row, the young soldier waking to find his legs gone. He's tying up young bamboo, their delicate tresses littered the driveway, shoveling a door through the snow to free the imprisoned azaleas. I half expect him to tend his trees with aspirin and soup, the gardener who finds in destruction the very reason to carry on, who would look at the ruins of Eden and tell the hovering angel to put down his sword, there was work to be done. And the last book <laughs> that I wrote before this one um, is called The Dog Runs Through It, and it's a collection of any poem I've ever written from the beginning that has a dog mentioned anyway for any of you dog people. Um, it was great fun to do. And I actually wrote a preface for it, um, which I've never done before, about the history of all the dogs I've ever had. So I'm going to read two of these. The New Dog. Into the gravity of my life, the serious ceremonies of polish and paper and pen, has come this manic animal whose innocent disruptions make nonsense of my old simplicities, as if I needed him to prove again that after all the careful planning, anything can happen. And for those of you, and I know there's at least one other person in the audience who has lost a dog, um, I end the book with an envoi for all, all of you dog owners. We're signing up for heartbreak. We know one day we'll rue it. But oh, the way our life lights up, the years a dog runs through it. And I'm going to end with the final poem in the new poems series, and then take your questions, if I can find it. It's called The Future, and it, it's a villanelle, a foam a form that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, <clears throat> The Future. It's a poem about retirement, really, and I know that there are a lot of people who are 
making that difficult decision whether to retire the future. When do we trade the future for the past? A farmer plows his fields one final time. I think each poem I write will be the last. The world grows small. It used to seem so vast. Retirees lie in bed till after nine. When do we trade the future for the past? They pull on trousers, sigh, and cut the grass. And I have lost the lust for making rhyme. I think each poem I write will be the last. The words come slowly now. They once came fast. Each fledgling ode becomes a hill to climb. When do we trade the future for the past? There's TV and the crossword. Days will pass. Walks on hard pipe pavement. Cities etched in grime. I fear each poem I write will be the last. Uncoupled metaphors go streaming past. The young are on their way. I watch them shine. When did I trade the future for the past? I think this poem I'm writing is the last. Thank you. After my Q&A poem, you people might be frightened to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody be brave. At, 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 at some college meetings when no one did anything, they had a little thing of candy for me, and I said, whoever asked the first question, I will give this candy to. <laughs> and, okay, hi. Absolutely, I have, um, a, a, right next to my bed is a drawer that opens with a notebook and a pencil, and in the middle of the night, often, I'll scribble down ideas. The problem is, in the morning, I can't read my handwriting, and it's frustrating to know that there was a poem there, and I can't find it, but I carry a notebook wherever I go, and, and I'm always putting down ideas, or just a thought, or an image, yeah, okay. So that wasn't so hard, somebody. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I, I never write poems thinking in terms of a book. I just write one poem at a time. And eventually, when I have you know five, five years' worth of poems, I'll spread them all out on the floor and look and try to see if, if, if there was any theme that I was thinking about at the time, if they made any sense. And only about, I've published all of those poems in magazines first. I do that as soon as I finish a poem. but. Out of a, a long, a large group of poems, I'll only think half of them, even though they were in magazines, were good enough for a book. The others just weren't. And then um, it's like writing another poem, putting a book together. And, and it's, it's exciting. It's sort of fun to see where you've been and where you didn't know you were going. And then, then it's done. Um, this was easier because um, I, I only had about 50 or so poems to choose from, and I, I had the feeling that this was probably my last book. And it was easy going through all the old books and choosing a couple of poems from them. So this book was easy to put together. But it's, it's an, an exciting and hard and important job. The, I, I think of a book as being another poem. Um, it it's, has to stand on its own, just as an individual poem must. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I think I read a few years ago, or maybe it was in the movie, or uh, something with John Hopwell, saying that when you come in in public in New York, and what you really want to do is write more poetry, but it is much harder to get published. 
Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's probably just as hard for young writers writing short stories to get published as it is for poets. There are so many poetry magazines now that I think um, it's not that hard to get into some kind of a magazine. Um, Updike, when he was dying, the last year of his life, wrote only poetry and remarkable poetry, by far the best poetry he'd ever written before, I think. Um, in terms of, of well, he, he just wrote anything, the New Yorker took it, that, that would be nice. Um, it, getting, the, the important thing for writers that are starting and sending things out to know is that not to trust the opinion of an editor. Um, you have to, if they say it's wonderful and you don't like it very much, you're right, the editor isn't and vice versa. My favorite story is I started writing when I was about 12 and I would send poems to The Atlantic. I mean, that's, that's the magazine that came to the house. And year after year after year, I would send them poems. And somewhere along the line, they started having two kinds of rejection slips. One was the ordinary, I'm sorry, there's no room for this poem. The other is, we really like this poem, we're sorry we can't take it, but please send us more. So over the years, I collected 10 of those special rejection slips. I clipped them together. I sent them to the Atlantic saying, I hear that you can change 10 of these for one acceptance. <laughs> I really did that. And nothing, nothing happened. <laughs> um, but what did happen was that that editor retired. And Peter Davidson became the editor. That editor didn't like my work. Peter Davidson did. And so from there on, I could publish in the Atlantic. It works the other way. Um, I published when, when Paul Muldoon was the New Yorker editor. He took almost everything I sent. Now there's a new poetry editor who doesn't even bother to write a note. He just doesn't take it. So. You, you can't listen to what an editor thinks. You have to go by what you know about, about your own work and not get discouraged. When I was starting, I was happier to get a rejection letter than not to get anything because it was like action. It meant that I was doing something. So that, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah? No, I'm, I, some magazines will accept um, the fact that you send various places. I don't know, I can't keep track, just one at a time, yeah. Judy. In terms of poetry, fiction, right. oh, that's difficult because being confined for four years to the apartment, all I do is read. Um, and I've, what I've been doing lately is rereading. Um, I, I recently finished rereading the, the books by Elizabeth Jane Howard. There are four of them about life in, in England during the Second World War. I love those books. And my memory is such that I hadn't read them in 20 years and it was like reading them for the first time. Um, the book I most recently finished was Eliz Elizabeth McCracken's new book, um, which purports to be a novel, but it's not really a novel, but I found it quite wonderful. Um, but I'm always, waiting for suggestions from people for what they've read to, to read next. Um, and I've also, when I read poetry, I, I, I don't read a lot of the, the very contemporary things that are coming out now. They just don't seem to, to reach me. Um, but I, I read the poets of my generation, most of whom have died, Galway's 
Canal's Book of Nightmares. Um, I, I, Sharon Olds, who's very much alive, and Carolyn Forche, I, I still enjoy those books. And Stephen Dunn, who died recently, who I, I love his work, and I don't know why, why it's not better known. But mostly I'm a fiction reader. Um, it's the only way to get through this confinement, actually, because it takes you someplace else. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, the interesting thing is that once I found what I consider my voice, I don't think that has changed very often. I think if you read some poems from my first book, A Perfect Circle of Sun, it still sounds like my poems, but my subject matter has changed completely because I write about what's happening in my life so that my early poems are about having children, domesticity, and my poems now are um, about aging and dying and retirement. So it's the subject that's changed, but I don't know why, because I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. I think you're supposed to evolve and get better and better. But my voice is, from the time I started, and I started seriously writing my 30s, which was late, um, I don't think that's changed very much, no. Good question. Yeah. Jackie. When I was a, a kid, a poem had to be rhythm and, and rhyme. And uh, that was the rule. Uh, I assume for many people that's the case. At what point did you discover that poetry didn't have to be rhythm and rhyme? Well, I wasn't the one that discovered it. <laughs> I mean, I, I was in, in college, I was madly in love with T.S. Eliot, and he came to read at Harvard, and I, I stalked him. He, he walked around Harvard Square, and I would be two blocks behind, just <laughs> fascinated. Um, I, as, as you know, I, I read a couple of poems today that did have both rhythm and rhyme, but it's actually harder to write a free verse poem because you have to invent the form for each poem. Um, there was a point when I couldn't stop writing sonnets. It was so easy. I mean, they told you exactly what to do. All you had to do was fill in the lines. So um, I, and when I'm blocked, and I'm, I'm not blocked often, um, I, I give myself an assignment of, of a form, and that can get me going again. Yeah. Way back there. You? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, for me personally, it makes my, my life worth living, too. So it, it gives me something to do every morning. Um, I think what poetry's main function is, is to make you look at the world in a new way, as if you're looking at it for the first time. And it, it, it can make you empathetic in a way that everyday life doesn't. And I think if you can make the connections um, and see the pain that you see in by reading poems, it'll give you more sympathy for things in everyday life and, and, that, that, and make you perhaps a kind of person that, that's crazily optimistic, but I, I like to think it's at least possible here and there. Yeah. They never told me about it. I had no idea what the, I mean, I was an only child and um, I was often alone at home because my father was a surgeon, my mother drove him around and they had a wonderful library and, and I found books there, but I never discussed it with them. Um, I, I think my father died before he knew I had published a book. Um, we, we didn't, I don't, I don't know what we talked about, we didn't talk about literature or poetry, and I had no idea if they ever read it. If they did, they never, ever. My, my father, I must say, um, 
knew Evangeline by heart. That was one poem he used to recite over and over. This is the forest primeval. The, I mean, that's the first poem I knew because he did know that poem. But that, that was it. Yeah, interesting. Right. Right. I also went to a, a wonderful school where they, um, they we did read poetry at school, and and um, I remember in the seventh grade we were each asked to to bring a poem, and I fa found a an Emily Dickinson poem that nobody ever reads or anything um, that I loved, and so school a, a really good school helped. Most schools are what make young people and therefore adults hate poetry when they have to say, what does this mean? And it's right or wrong. And it really turns young people off. Um, one of the things that I thought was so great that Billy Collins did when he was um, li he was librarian then, um, he put together a group of poems and sent them off to schools and said that they were to read them a poem aloud in the morning um, over the PA system, he would find the poem. The only rule was the teacher was not to ask them what the poem meant. So, yeah. Oh, that that completely depends on the poem. I have had poem. when I worked very hard on a poem for say weeks, which is possible. Then all of a sudden, I can write a poem in an hour. It it just comes. The energy that that was expended somehow um, makes itself felt that way. But there is no rule. Usually, I work about a week changing things. I have a couple of wonderful first readers who tell me what's wrong, and then I go back and try to fix things. Um, but it's nice the few times when it just comes. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I've been very like my. I've had books. A book is about to come out of my work in Spanish. I've had it translated into French, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, and of course, I don't read those languages. So I try to find someone I know who does and say, "Will you read this and tell me if it's any good?" But that's that's the closest I can come because I have a little high school French, but that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. I c I can't tell. No. But it's fun to have it sitting out there, and particularly when it's Chinese or Hebrew, and it looks so different on the page. I couldn't possibly send it out. Right. Anybody else? A last question. The title of your book. Oh well, I can read you the the title poem. We could end that way. Um, it's from the new poems, if I can find it. It's called, on page 12, Almost an Elegy for Tony Hoagland. Your poems make me want to write my poems, which is a kind of plagiarism of the spirit but when your death reminds me that mine is on its way, I close the book, clinging to this tenuous world the way the leaves outside cling to their trees just before they turn color and fall. I need time to read all the poems you left behind which pierced the darkness here at my window but did nothing to save you. So. Finding a title for a book is also um, hard. I go through long. I mean, it takes a long time, but when when you get to it, it, it feels good. So, okay. Thank you.